Welcome back, everybody. So we started this conference with great class, and we continue with no less class. I'm very pleased to um, introduce the next speaker of the morning, Luna Lomonaco from IMPA, who will talk about the modular Mandelbrot set. Thank you very much, Luca. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Luna. Um, uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. A uh, bit scary to speak after Smirno, but yes. <laughs> and uh, today I'm going to tell you about the modular Mandelbrot set. The modular Mandelbrot set is this guy, this fractal, and uh, it determines the behavior of a family of objects that encodes the dynamics of both quadratic rational maps and the modular group. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you a bit about dynamics of rational maps, the dynamics of Kleinian groups, and how these two worlds can get together. OK. Uh, if we start iterating a rational map, its action gives a partition of the Riemann sphere into two completely invariant subsets. Uh, the stable set, which is the Fatu set, which is defined as uh, the set of Z uh, around which the family of iterates is a key continuous, and the complement, which is the Julia set. Uh, here, uh, I draw the, well, the Julia set for the map uh, zeta square is the unit circle, as if we are in the uh, unit disk, the iterates will converge to zero, and if we are outside the closed unit disk, the iterates will converge to, the orbit will converge to infinity. The Julia, uh, by definition, the, field, uh, the FATO set is open, and the Julia set is closed, uh, we have that the Julia set either has empty interior, either is the whole sphere, and that uh, repelling periodic points are dense in the Julia set. Now, changing world, we can enter the world of Kleinian groups. And, well, Kleinian groups are discrete subgroups of uh, PSL 2C. And the action of a Kleinian group on the Riemann sphere also gives a partition of the Riemann sphere into two completely invariant subsets. One is the domain of normality, which here is called the ordinary set or the discontinuous set, and the other is the complement, which is the limit set here. Uh, in this talk, we are particularly interested in the modular group, which is, uh, which can be generated by these two element, alpha of zeta is zeta plus one, and beta of zeta is zeta over one plus zeta. Uh, the ordinary set for the modular group is the upper and the lower half plane, and the limit set is the real line. And since the same happens uh, upstairs and downstairs, uh, here I represent just the upper half plane. Uh, again, we can see, uh, we can, one can show that the ordinary set is open and the limit set is closed. The limit set either has empty interior or is the whole sphere. And the fixed points of the elements of the group are dense in the limit set. Uh, so these two words, the word of rational maps, iteration of rational maps on the Riemann sphere, and the word of action of Kleinian groups on the Riemann sphere are not that different. Uh, as the action of both of them gives a partition of the Riemann sphere into two completely invariant subsets, the domain of normality and this complement. In the case of rational maps, the domain of normality is called the Fatu set, and its complement is the Julia set. While in the case of Kleinian groups, the domain of normality is called the ordinary set, 
and its complement is the limit set. This is something that already Fatou realized about 100 years ago. And Sullivan uh, started uh, um, realized again in the 80s uh, when he started uh, writing down uh, all the correspondences between these two words in what it has become known as the Sullivan Dictionary, and that culminate in his proof of the no wandering domains theorem uh, by uh, being inspired by the proof of Alford's finiteness theorem, importing uh, quasi conformal, uh, the quasi conformal theory and quasi conformal surgery in the world of iteration of rational maps, making a big revolution in our world. And uh, well, these two words are not that different. And in this talk, we are interested in uh, whether we can combine these two words in a single object. Uh, but for this to happen, we need an object that can be a group and that can be a map, because a map is not a group and a group is not a map, right? So we leave the world of maps and the world of groups, and we enter the world of holomorphic correspondences. What is a holomorphic correspondence? A holomorphic correspondence is a multi-valued map defined by the zeros of a polynomial in zeta and w. So uh, the zero of a polynomial in zeta and w gives you an algebraic surface. And uh, <coughs> uh, we can consider the projection in the Riemann sphere where zeta lives and the projection in the Riemann sphere where w lives. And uh, the holomorphic correspondence is the object that sends to each zeta the corresponding w. Well, let me make a draw. It was shorter that way, but yeah. <laughs> so let's say that we have a polynomial p zeta w with degree two in zeta and degree two in w. It's zeros, gives you an algebraic surface in C2. P zeta w equals zero. Then we can consider the projection on the Riemann sphere. Where zeta lives, the projection in the Riemann sphere where w lives. And the correspondence is this object. So for each zeta here, we have two w upstairs that kills your polynomial. And these are your images. So each zeta goes to two w. And for each w here, we have two zetas here that kills your polynomial. And these are your pre-images, which is another one. And then you start iterating this thing. And it's not difficult to see that these things become some mess pretty soon. <laughs> so why are, am I telling you about this? Well, because, <coughs> oppa, what happened? Ah, okay, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, because we can write a rational map as a correspondence and we can write a group as a correspondence. If we are a, a rational map, a P over Q, we can write it as a correspondence by taking for polynomial, the polynomial W Q of zeta minus P of zeta. And uh, if my rational maps has degree N, this becomes a N to one correspondence. On the other hand, if we have a Klein group with N generators, we can write it as a correspondence by taking by, as a polynomial, the product of a W multiplied by the lower part um, of the generator minus 
the upper part of the generator. In particular, uh, the modular group has two generators, so we can write it as a two to two correspondence. Okay, so a correspondence can be a group, can be a map, can it be both at the same time? In technical term, you will say, can we mate a group and a map into a correspondence? And what is a mating? Well, a mating between an object A and an object B is an object C which behaves like A on an invariant subset of its domain and as B on the complement. They exist in the world of rational maps. You can uh, uh, mate, mate two polynomials and you will get a rational map. And they exist, actually they started in the world of climbing groups. And here we are interested in can we mate a rational map and a climbing group? And why are we interested in this? Well, I mean, uh, if this was possible, it would be a concrete example of how these two worlds can combine. It would be a kiss, well, a mate between the two worlds. But now the first question that we need to answer is, uh, are the dynamics of a map and a group compatible? So, Liruna, can I ask a question? Yes. Please. Uh, what's the relation between this mating and this picture, this correspondence that you draw? Maybe uh, if they exist, they will be, uh, they can exist as correspondences. If a mating exists, it will exist as correspondence. Well, actually, they, there has been recently uh, works uh, as the mating becomes uh, in different settings. But uh, in this setting, our okay. matrix will be correspondence. Okay. It will be in the two slides. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry right. if I interrupt you just one second. I may just remind everyone that they're welcome to ask questions, of course. But if you ask questions, please raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you because we are recording this. So that way we can uh, record the questions as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so are the dynamics of a map and of a group compatible? And yes, they are. This is something that Sean Bullet and Chris Penrose realized in the 90s, in the early 90s. Uh, there is a map that uh, conjugates the dynamics of the modular group on its limit set with the dynamics of zeta square and its inverse, actually, on their limit set, their Julia set. What am I speaking about? Uh, well, the map zeta square on the unit circle is the doubling map because the modulus uh, remains one and the argument doubles. And there is a map, if this is the upper half plane with PSL to Z, so we have alpha and beta, there is a map, the Minkowski map, that conjugates the dynamics of alpha and beta on the negative real axis to the doubling map, to the doubling map, yes, and conjugates the dynamics of the generators of the modular group on the positive real axis with the halting map. So in principle, we could fit here the doubling map and here its inverse. And the fact that uh, the modular group fits with the doubling map with zeta square actually means that fits with a lot of other maps. For example, with quadratic polynomials. If we consider zeta square plus c, uh, infinity is super attracting, and uh, we can consider the set of points with bounded orbit, which we called the field Julia set, which is the complement of the basing of attraction of infinity. In this case, the Julia set is the common boundary between uh, the field Julia set and the basing of attraction of infinity. 
And uh, Butcher already in the 19th century realized that in a neighborhood of infinity, we can conjugate the action of a quadratic polynomial with its leading term, zeta squared. And if my field Julia set is connected, uh, this conjugacy uh, extends to the whole basin of attraction of infinity. And if it is locally connected, it extends as a semi-conjugacy, oh, sorry, on its Julia set. Here I draw the um, field Julia set of some elements of the quadratic family. Here is for C equals zero, we saw it before. Here is with C equal one quarter, and this is one quarter plus epsilon. And uh, the set of parameters for which the field Julia set is connected is called the connectedness locus, and it's the Mandelbrot set, this guy. Zero is here, one quarter is the cusp, and one quarter plus epsilon is here outside. And this, in these two cases, my Julia set is locally connected and will work this construction we work, actually in all these connected cases. So, Sean and Chris, in the early 90s, defined a mating between a quadratic polynomial and the modular group to be what? A 2-2 correspondence, um, such that its dynamics gives a partition of the Riemann sphere into two completely invariant subsets. One on which my correspondence, uh, the branches of my correspondence are conjugated to the generators of the modular group. And uh, the complement being a set where on one part we have the dynamics of a quadratic polynomial and on another part uh, we have the dynamics of the inverse of the quadratic polynomial. Uh, and they show that if these objects exist, they all live in this family of quadratic correspondences, of 2-2 two -two correspondences. This is the limit set of one guy in this family. And outside, we can see that there is a, it looks like having the tessellation of the modular group. And inside, we see these two sets, which looks like two copies of this field Julia set. Uh, in, when I did this construction, they didn't manage to prove that this guy is actually a mating but they manage with another guy in his family, but be this guy actually. <laughs> uh, but before, let me tell you a little bit how is the dynamics of this family. Uh, Stefano, I started at what time? At quarter past 11. Okay, 20 minutes. Yes. Okay, um, so, these objects uh, were cooked up such that for everybody we have a disk which is forward invariant, which in this picture is the, I'm not sure where to say the right or the left half plane, depends if I, but I mean this half plane, okay. And uh, the complement is backward invariant. What does it mean? Let me make a draw that probably makes it more comprehensible. Here I show, well, a caricature of that picture. And this line, which is in the, in the picture is the imaginary axis, is sent by one branch of the correspondence here and by the other branch here. So this goes one to two here inside, and then it goes inside, and then it goes inside, and then it goes inside. And this, which we call the forward limit set, is the intersection of the iterates 
of this disk. Here, uh, we have that the inverse of our correspondence sends this line to this one and to this one. So actually my correspondence behave like a two to one map between this set and this half plane. Not in a neighborhood, just on this set. This point is actually sent here with, by both branches. Okay, and uh, we can define the backward limit set as the intersection of the pre-images of the complement of my disk. And uh, by construction between this half plane and this half plane, uh, well, on your side is uh, left, between the left and the right, we have the map, we have an involution which in this coordinates is zeta goes to minus zeta. This is for everybody having two images and two pre-images. Okay? Now, by construction, we see that here the dynamics is expanding and here is contraction contracting, and this guy is parabolic fixed point of multiplier one for everybody. And uh, my correspondence on the backward limit set is conjugated to the inverse of the correspondence in the forward limit set. Okay. Uh, these are some picture of limit set of these guys. And this is the connectedness locus of this family. Okay? Uh, as I said in, the, in that paper, they managed to prove that this guy, which is the, the center, is a mating between uh, zeta square and the modular group. Okay. Looking at the picture, the conjecture that this family contains a mating between each quadratic polynomial and the modular group, and moreover that the connectedness locus is homeomorphic to the Mandelbrot set. And uh, they managed to prove the dynamics conjecture for a bench of parameters, but not for all because uh, everybody in this family has a parabolic fixed point. While uh, a, a polynomial is expanding around its field Julia set. The field Julia set is the complement of the basing of attraction of infinity. So in order to prove the, polyno uh, the polynomial, in order to prove the, the statement, they were first breaking the parabolic fixed point, show that you have a polynomial, and then come back. But this suggests that maybe you should deal with the parabolic fixed point. And, the con and maybe considering that this may be meetings between parabolic quadratic rational maps and the modular group. So we consider the parabolic counterpart, if we want, of the quadratic uh, family, which is the family per one, which is the family of maps zeta plus one over zeta plus a. Well, actually it's a family of conjugacy class up to conformal conjugacy. And uh, why do I say that it's parabolic counterpart of the quadratic polynomials? Well, because I mean here for everybody in the family, infinity is again fixed, but it's parabolic with multiplier one. So it has a basing of attraction, I mean, uh, a basing of attraction and we can consider its field Julia set to be the complement of the basing of attraction. Okay, uh, here we have some uh, field Julia set, in black is the field Julia set, outside is the basing of attraction of infinity, which is this point. And the connectedness locus for this family is this guy, the parabolic Mandelbrot set, which is homeomorphic to the Mandelbrot set by a recent work of Carson Peterson and Pascal Hoche. I should say that uh, the map 
that encodes the dynamics outside the field Julia set of these maps is this map zeta square plus one over three over one plus zeta square over three, which on the circle is topologically conjugate to zeta square. Why do I say this? Because these guys also, the dynamics of these guys on the boundary also fit with zeta square and hence with the modular group. Okay? So what do we do? Well, we define the mating between a, a quadratic irrational maps and the modular group to be a 2 2 correspondence for which the dynamics partitions the Riemann sphere into two completely invariant subsets. Uh, one open in which uh, my correspondence is conformally conjugate to the generators of the modular group here. And on the other one, on the backward limit set, my branch is a hybrid conjugate to a, a member of the family per one one on its field Julia set. If we bring home this part, the other one comes because it's the same dynamics. Okay, and we manage to prove that for each parameter in the connectedness locus, my family of correspondences, SA that I showed you before, the, with the long expression, it's a mating between uh, a, the modular group and the quadratic rational maps in per one one, and that the connectedness loci are homeomorphic, dynamically homeomorphic. So if uh, I send one parameter, a uh, little a to capital A, uh, the dynamics about uh, the backward limit set of the correspondence corresponding to that parameter <laughs> is every con uh, conjugate to the dynamics about the field Julia set of the quadratic correspondence about the field Julia set of that parameter. This was very difficult to say, but I managed. Okay. And uh, we also, pr ah, sorry. This homeomorphism is conformal on the interior of the connectedness locus and extended to a pinched neighborhood. Uh, and uh, by Carson and uh, Pascal result, we have that the modular Mandelbrot set, our connected locus is actually homeomorphic to the Mandelbrot set. We also developed a theory for these guys that parallels the theory of quadratic polynomials. We have a map that uniformizes the complement of the limit set to the upper half plane, conjugating the dynamics to the dynamics of the generators of the modular group in the same spirit as the butcher map conjugates the dynamics outside the field Julia set to the dynamics of zeta square. And we have external geodesics which play the roles of external rays in the polynomial theory. And in the sense that uh, periodic geodesics land at periodic points and uh, repelling periodic points are landing points of periodic geodesics. And using this we can prove a Yokos inequality uh, which very roughly speaking is an inequality that tells you how much uh, repelling periodic points can repel uh, in terms of how it turns. But has as a consequence giving you a bound of what they are called the limbs of the connectedness locus. These things attached to this, you, to this rugby ball. And the fact that the, here we have a Q square instead of a Q, like in the polynomial case, tells you that these limbs shrink more with respect to the rugby ball than uh, in the, uh, that the limbs of the Mandelbrot with respect to the cardioid. Okay, at this point I should say that uh, um, there are recently related works uh, on the antilomorphic setting uh, done by Misha, Makarov, and uh, other people uh, in terms of uh, Schwartz reflections uh, and Kleinian reflection groups. And
And in the, ah, this is a picture that illustrates the theorem. We have a homeomorphism between this guy and this guy. And this point, the center, goes to the center. This is the limit set um, corresponding to the center parameter. And in a double pinched neighborhood of the backward limit set, uh, our correspondence is conjugate to the dynamics of uh, the member of pair one one correspo opa, corresponding um, with parameter the center of the main hyperbolic component of the parabolic uh, Mandelbrot set. And this is the limit set corresponding to this point, and this is the limit set corresponding to this point. Uh, the dynamics in our restriction of the limit sets are conjugated, and this is the parameter which corresponds to the center of this component, and the, which goes to this, with this parameter, which corresponds to this field Julia set, sorry. <laughs> okay, and uh, since each um, talks should have a proof, let me tell you in the last 10 minutes an idea of how we prove the theorem. So, uh, we saw that for every uh, member of pair 1, 1, the field Julia set is the complement of the basing of attraction of infinity. So, the idea is to glue by quasi conformal surgery the basing of attraction of infinity outside the backward limit set by quasi conformal surgery. And to do it, we use a oro cycles at the parabolic fixed point. Let me be a bit more precise on this. So, if we look our member of pair one one, uh, here we have infinity, here we have outside the basing of attraction of infinity, everything goes here. And if we take a neighborhood, we can cut the dynamics between attracting to repelling by using oro cycles or pre images of uh, invariant line under Fatou coordinates. Now, if we look at our uh, correspondence, we still, we don't have a map in a neighborhood, but we still have an attracting and a repelling dynamics, and we can still use oro cycles to make, to partition that on a neighborhood. But since uh, we don't have a map on a neighborhood, we have to start using, well, this is a caricature of the caricature. <laughs> uh, we should start by taking a pinched neighborhood of this guy We look at pretty much, let's call it the pinch neighborhood uh, L, F, the pretty much. L prime F. Here we have a two to one map, F. Now, doing the same here, we just cut. We will end up with this picture, but step by step. So. We para 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 pa pa. We have our pinch neighborhood L P and the pretty much pa pa. here L prime P here again is two to one map P A 
Okay, we can cut the dynamics here. We can enlarge the pinched neighborhood to a neighborhood where this guy is a map. And here we can enlarge the pinched neighborhood to a neighborhood where the guy is, uh, is not a map anymore. This is why I didn't start with a neighborhood uh, at the first moment. But we can cut the dynamics between attracting and repelling using Oro cycles. Pa, pa, and ta, ta. And I claim that we can construct a quasi-conformal map between the annulus made by the neighborhood minus the pre-image of the pinch neighborhood up to your, your cycles, which is this set. And if this is possible, there, then we, uh, we are morally almost done because we can extend this uh, map to the unbounded component and use it to pull back the almost complex structure here, there, and use the me measurable Riemann mapping theory, theorem. So how do we construct this map? Well, on the repelling part, up to the invariant rays, Euro cycles, it's easy because we have uh, honest quadrilaterals, honest quadrilaterals, it's easy. The tricky part is here because we have cusps. How we do it? Well, the trick is to straighten up my cusp by using uh, uh, the uniformization of the limit set. Uh, the, of the complements of the limit set to the complement of the closed unit disk. So we take our Riemann map between C minus K to C minus the closed unit disk. And we look at the dynamics here which ends up being the dynamics of the map I showed you before, zeta square plus one over three over zeta square over three plus one. And we take, okay, this map ends up being far away, but whatever. The same here, the Riemann map from C minus the backward limit set to C minus the unit disk. And we call this map here, let's call it G. Now, uh, our um, Oro cycles here straight up. And uh, we can't, since we don't care which Oro cycles are, we can define these to be Oro cycles which are conformally conjugate to those ones by taking pre-image of the image under FATU coordinates of those arcs. So my FATU gives a conformal conjugacy on the race. Now, using the estimates of Shishikura that Shishikura did about the asymptotics of FATU coordinates, one can show that this conformal conjugacy extends to a quasi-symmetric conjugacy to the whole race, so including the parabolic fixed point. Then once you have a quasi-symmetric map between the whole race to the whole curve, then you're happy, you're basically done because you just take 
the image of this guy there and the image there, your favorite quasi-conformal map between the two, and you, the favorite, your favorite quasi-conformal interpolation between these two uh, quasi-disks, and then you have a quasi-conformal map between this guy and this guy, which you can then pull back here, and then it's how you construct a quasi-conformal map. Then you extend your quasi-conformal map to the unbounded component which is easy peasy because you don't have cusps anymore. And uh, you use it to uh, define here a new and most complex structure, which is the pre-image of the standard one under this quasi-conformal map uh, on the unbounded component. Uh, the pullback by this, by, by map, my correspondence, which is a map outside the limit set, the standard structure on the limit set, then you straight and you show that what you obtain is going to be a holomorphic map on the Riemann sphere with a parabolic fixed point of multiplier one, which you can normalize to put at infinity, critical points at plus minus one, pa pa, you are in pair one one. Now, this clearly induces a map between the connectedness logic. And in order to prove that this map is a homeomorphism, uh, you use standard techniques of holomorphic motion, do a Hubbard in uh, Lubitsch formulation. The tricky part is to show that you have holomorphic motion. <laughs> uh, so you have to construct these cycles to move holomorphically, and you need this neighborhood to be holomorphic and to have an angle, because if you see If you consider as a neighborhood the whole uh, left plane, the pre-image of this line makes a cusp there. And the cusps are not good, uh, are not friends of quasi-conformal surgery. So you have to show that uh, these guys are all inside uh, some neighborhood uh, which makes here an angle less than pi. And these neighborhoods moves holomorphically. And this is something that you can do uh, using uh, the Yokut's inequality I told you before, which tells you that this guy is actually inside a loom, which has as a consequence that all the backward limit sets are inside the loom, which you can use for your uh, construction. Then you can use holomorphic motion. You can show that uh, you have homeomorphism. You still have to show that the, your homeomorphism is going to be surjective, uh, which is tricky. You have to count the limb. You have to go around uh, this guy limb by limb, basically. But you can do it. <laughs> and this is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and happy birthday, Marcello. Thank you very much, Luna. Any questions? Since it can be deformed to some correspondences for which you observe similar phenomena, you can produce some families of correspondences. Yeah, you can embed it in a two parameter family. Yeah. Uh, which is, looks very much like this one, but it has a K there. And another K, I don't remember, but it really looks like this one. And uh, uh, those ones are matings uh, uh, between uh, quadratic maps, uh, quadratic polynomials, actually, and uh, discrete uh, uh, faithful representation of C2 times C3 with discrete, uh, which disconnected uh, limit set. If you are, if you consider
the discrete representations uh, here, if you parameterize uh, by the um, ratio what's of the um, fixed points of the two, uh, you end up with this picture. These are discrete, the discrete ones. The modular set is here. And here, your limit set is disconnected, it's a counter. And they show that here inside, you have matings uh, between uh, uh, these guys and quadratic polynomials, actually, because here is hyperbolic and hyperbolic, so it's easy. And you would end up in uh, a map that looks like that. And actually, Miguel, my PhD student, is looking at the continuity of this construction. Thank you, Luna. So I have a question, actually. I'm not sure if this question even makes sense. But it's a two-part question. Does it make sense to ask whether this, uh, this homeomorphism has a higher regularity in somehow? Does it preserve certain structures? Does it preserve Hausdorff dimension? Does it preserve uh, Lebesgue measure? Uh, which homeomorphism? The one between connecting and Slotchi? No, no, the, no. The, 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 the homeomorphism between the two Mandelbrot sets. Yes, the, uh, yes. between the connectedness. Yes. Uh, well, it's conformal on the... Where is this guy? Can you use it to deduce, you know, to, to, de to prove something about the Mandelbrot set, for example? Can you well, use this would be a dream. Yes. But uh, what we know is that it's conformal on the, on the interior, uh, both in uh, hyperbolic components and if they exist, the ghost components. And uh, I believe it's quasi conformal, but we didn't prove it yet. So it's, that but it's not going to be a difference. So, so if it's quasi conformal, what implications would that have? Would that have implications for? I don't know at this stage of the okay. <laughs> <laughs> of the championship. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions? No, okay, let's thank the speaker again.